You enlisted in the army in 1983. And so you're deep, deep, deep into your career and 9-11 happens. Where were you and, and what do you remember about that day? Uh, I was in Alexandria, Virginia uh, on 9-11 and uh, for a three day weekend. And I was headed back to Fort Bragg and Fayetteville, North Carolina. And once we all learned that it was a, a terrorist attack. Uh, my first thought was uh, to talk to my unit and figure out what you know we needed to do or what the unit had in store for me. So I was uh, talking to my unit, um, you know, knowing that obviously um, things were going to be a little bit uh, different, at least in the short term. I actually went down to uh, Tampa to work at U.S. Central Command uh, headquarters. Uh, you know, concerning the war, I was down in Tampa from from uh, September of 2001 until about, um, I don't know, May 2002. And then we deployed to, um, the 82nd deployed to Afghanistan in August of 2002. August 2002. Yeah. Um, what was your first... Um, uh, your first impression of Afghanistan, where did, where did you arrive? And I'm always interested in that, that first impression when the, the door on the plane opens yeah. and you step out and see and smell the place for the first time. What's your, what's your first impression? Um, it looked like a, so that was Bodrum, Afghanistan, the huge Soviet air base that they mm -hmm. built. The vast expanse of desert and desolation and how high the mountains were was what struck me. Um, you know, I've been out west, I've been uh, west of the U.S., I've been to the desert, but I had never seen anything like that vast desolation, as I'll call it. So that was the, uh, what I felt. And you fly into, into Bagram, and as you say, that was a base built by the Soviets, is that right? That's correct. That's correct. And I think I have a photo of yours that you have, um, you've labeled Soviet junk. Is, if I, if I <laughs> there was Soviet junk. Yeah, there was Soviet junk everywhere. I, uh, it was just, the landscape was just littered with tanks and aircraft uh, and different things that would just burn out. I think that particular junk was actually at the airfield, but I used to travel uh, yeah. from Bagram up to Kabul once per week. And, you know, the road was just littered with old Soviet tanks. Well, there, so there I see a Soviet tank there with the, the flag in front of a what looks to be a house or something. Mm -hmm. And then um, I'm looking at the pile of those are old Soviet planes there that are just sort of in a heap. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. I'm wondering if seeing all of that, seeing the Soviet junk flying into an old Soviet base, knowing, as I'm sure you did, that the Soviets had been there for 10 years and had had their own little Vietnam experience in uh, Afghanistan. Um, well, I'm just wondering what, what went through your mind when you, when you saw these reminders of, of Soviet failure in Afghanistan. How did that impact your thinking about, about your work and, and the mission in Afghanistan? I have to tell you, it didn't at all, Preston. And I think that's because I and most of my colleagues were just focused on the immediate task. Uh, and you're just thinking about what you need to do and what you must plan. And those, honestly, those kinds of thoughts just did not come <laughs> into, okay. into my mind. Wow. Well, what, what, was, your, what was your work? Um, what were you tasked to do? And you're there in 2002, 2003. What, what generally was your work in Afghanistan? So I was, so in the 82nd Airborne Division headquarters, um, you have the, the main G2, the senior intelligence officer. Um, and then you have two of his subordinates, uh, operations guy and a planning guy. And I was the operations guy. And so we actually had a brigade of the 82nd down in Kandahar. 
And so they were kind of the major muscle movement uh, of the division. And so my, my job uh, as a current uh, operations uh, chief was just to make sure that our uh, ISR uh, intelligence uh, resources were um, coordinated and flying and that I kind of knew um, what our friendly force was doing, what the, what the enemy reports were. I was always, I was always, um, I knew that my primary role was to be able to tell the general, the commanding general, um, what uh, the current situation was and what, you know, the enemy most likely course of action was. It, so it's always predictive uh, analysis. So that was primarily my role there in, in the division headquarters. And I had, I don't know, 10 or 11 people under me, a couple of lieutenants and some uh, non-commissioned officers. And, you know, so we, in, inside the headquarters, uh, we had, you know, the watch, the watch, if you will, inside the headquarters, you know, the G3, G2, G1, 24 hours of operations. And so just also supervising my personnel, make, you know, training them, yeah. Um, making sure they knew what was going on. Yeah, that's a big part of it. It was a very safe environment, 2002. I mean, it was, um, uh, you know, there was really very little violence. Uh, you could drive around in thin-skinned vehicles. So, frankly, it was not a very, um, uh, you know, rapid, uh, rapid environment. Were, were you based at Bagram there? Yes, that's right. That's where you're based. And, Inside that, that, the Soviets had this, they built this huge aircraft. You can see pictures of a huge aircraft um, structure there, that, that hangar. And I mean, it's the biggest hangar I've ever seen in my life. And um, it was just a huge thing. And so we had just, actually the 10th Mountain Division before us had built a little uh, wooden headquarters in there. Mm. And uh, so we just we moved uh, in, inside that. At this time, uh, were you able to go into Kabul? Yes, I went to Kabul every Monday and I attended a, an NGO meeting, non-government organization meeting. Uh, there was um, some NGOs had formed and uh, there and there were trying, different NGOs trying to do different things. And I went in my uniform uh, just to kind of figure out what was going on. They had no problem with me being there. Uh, and so, yeah, I would, I would go up to, a, you know, Kabul, I don't know, 45, 50 kilometers or something like that. And um, we'd drive up there in thin skinned vehicles and uh, come wow. back. It was never, you know, never, never any problem. So at that time, it felt safe. It was, well, it felt safe. Uh, yeah, it actually sounds like it actually, actually was safe at that time. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, and I had, Actually, I had 11 interpreters that I was in charge of. They would go out with their infantry. And so that was kind of an interesting experience being, if you talk about um, things that, that, that you find interesting, I think dealing with them was quite interesting. Here's 11 guys that were Afghans. They spoke good English. They'd never left the country. Now they're working for us. And just to talk with them and, you know, their perceptions. And of course, they all wanted to come to the U.S. Um, and um, uh, yeah, that, that, was, that was quite uh, fascinating uh, for me, de dealing with those 11 guys during that period. Well, and I have your photos here, a number of photos that you took of, of Afghan civilians, including women in the, you know, the full, is, is burqa the right word? Um, um, and I imagine that by this time you had done a fair amount of traveling and you'd seen other countries. What, what was your impression um, when you're interacting with these Afghans, when you're in Kabul, um, you're seeing the sights, you're smelling the smells. What was your impression of the country? And, and kind of what's behind that question is, you know, President Bush's idea of not just taking out the Taliban and Al Qaeda, but helping the country to become a, a functional country, sort of as Westerners think of it. Um, and so that's kind of what's, what's behind the, the, the question. What was your impression of the culture of the country? 
I, I really have to say, and this is not to be demeaning to the Afghans, but really just Stone Age and, and tribal. Uh, and if you would ask me, you know, can we try to make a, a country, you know, out of this place, I, I probably would, would have said no, uh, because there was just nothing there. They didn't have any, you know, much training, much experience. And, you know, we know the history of Afghanistan. Um, and so, yeah, I think just Stone Age, tribal, and um, I never would have thought that it would have been a place that we would have invested so much time and money trying to make it something that, you know, you cannot make it. Because we think of, if I'm, if I'm hearing you right, we think of Afghanistan as a country. We look at a map and say, oh, there are the borders around a country called Afghanistan. But from, and I'm interested in your response, from talking to people who spent time there and who have interacted with the folks there, what I've heard, I'm interested in what you think, that the people who live there don't think of Afghanistan as a country. They don't have a concept of the country of Afghanistan. They have a concept of their group, of their tribe. And this idea of making Afghanistan a functional country is just not going to work because the large majority of people who live there don't even have don't even get that concept. It's just not a concept that they that they live with. Did, what what do you think about that? Uh, that yeah, that's one hundred percent correct. And if you read articles on why we failed in Afghanistan, a lot of writers will point that out that we tried to impose a federal system. Uh, on these people, but they are just community-based, tribal-based. That's their outlook. I mean, Kabul might as well be Chicago. And so that definitely was one of our failings to you know, try to institute a federal system because it's not going to work. And another thing, another problem that um, we had is that our military system is geared towards procurement and maintenance. I mean, if you don't maintain items, they're, they're gonna go away, they're gonna rust, they're gonna die. And many of these countries, I mean, this is the way it is. I mean, Iraq and Afghanistan, they don't understand, frankly, the, at least in their militaries, the concept of maintenance. And so we try right. to impose these armaments on them, but, they didn't know how to we train them, but they didn't know how to maintain them and they wouldn't maintain them. So I think that was two uh, big flaws uh, that we had to try to impose the federalist system. Um, and secondly, to try to give them so much equipment that they had to maintain. maintain. Do it. Because maintenance, you know, maintenance um, implies long term thinking. You know, maintaining something today, today, so that it still works in three years, sort of thing. Um, and it sounds like, you know, in the, the context you're describing, long-term thinking just isn't, just isn't very prevalent. Yeah, it it isn't. And of course, there's books and articles and things written on that. But um, you know, the old inshallah, you know, if God wills it, and mm -hmm. it, it, they seem to leave a lot just up to fate. Um, and, and, and that's right. They just don't think very much. They're not very forward looking uh, in that way. So, yeah, yeah. You mentioned that part of your work as an intelligence officer uh, meant um, having information about friendly forces. By that, did you mean friendly Afghan forces? Uh, friendly Afghan forces, uh, coalition forces, okay. uh, and our forces. Uh, yeah, we had actually... We had uh, Lithuanians. We had well, we, we had some Australians with us, and um, I have some funny stories on that. But we had uh, Lithuanians uh, with us. I'll never forget these Lithuanians. Uh, they were Lithuan Lithuanian special forces. They were very good. Mm. I remember when they were getting ready to go out on their first operation. We were gonna, uh, we were giving them a rules of engagement. Uh, briefing and their senior officer uh, said, "Excuse me." He said to me, "He said, um, what are rules of engagement?" Uh, and so that concept, you know, how we fight um, versus how other people fights, 
Um, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, when it comes to doctrine and execution, a lot of problems there. But uh, in any sense, the Lith Lithuanian special forces were very good. The Australians uh, were very good. If you look back on your year in, in Afghanistan, um, I'm sure interesting things happened, you know, probably nearly every day, something happened that it would be a story to, to bring home um, to the extent that you could talk about it. Cause I think a lot that you did, you, you're not allowed to talk about because it, it involved intelligence gathering. Um, is there something that you are able to talk about that especially stands out in your mind um, when you think about your year in Afghanistan? <laughs> well, you know, one of the more poignant stories is actually a, a, a funny story. And I think it gets to the point at the end of the day that humans are humans are humans. So <clears throat> I had these 11 interpreters and they were in a tent uh, in our compound. And they were always inviting me over to have tea and have food and you know, sometimes I would, I, I would go over there just to, you know, break bread with them and be friendly. And they were always so interested in uh, the United States. They always had a lot of questions, just general cultural questions. And so I remember it was the night of Ramadan in 2002, and they had invited me over, the first night of Ramadan, they invited me over uh, for the Ramadan feast, if you will. And so I had this good idea. I said, you know, at that time, people from the States were just sending us all kinds of food and magazines and whatever. And so I said, you know, I've got a stack of magazines here. You know, I'm just going to take these magazines and I'm going to give them to the interpreters. They can read, they can see pictures, and I'll give them some idea of the States. Yeah. So you might know where this story is going here. So I, I go over there and I get in the tent and one of them's you know, praying and, uh, and they all gather around me. Oh, what do you have? And I'm like, well, you're interested in the U.S. So I brought some magazines. And uh, this one is about hunting, filled and stream. Oh, Major Carter, the oh, American forest is so beautiful. I really like it. Mm. Uh, and then, oh, this is um, ESPN magazine. Oh, American sports. Yes, we know about American football. We really like it. Well, the third one happened to be a Maxim magazine, which all of your readers may not know what it is. It's kind of a, uh, it's not a pornographic magazine, but it's kind of racy. There's always a scantily clad woman on the cover. So when I pulled the Ma Maxim magazine out, there was just utter silence. That's shock. And I'm like, of course, I knew immediately I, I made a mistake. And um one of them, the lead interpreter says, you know, Major Carter, I'm, I'm so sorry, but during the month of Ramadan, we cannot look upon the flesh of a woman. I said, yes, I understand that. I'm so sorry. You know, I'll take it back with me. And there was still just stone cold silence. And after a couple of seconds, he says, no, we will hide it for a month. And so okay. I left <laughs> we'll let them at, we'll hang yeah, on. yeah we'll hang on to it uh and that's i guess when i kind of realized at the end of the day you know people are people are people we all kind of have all the the same needs i think that kind of leveled the the playing yeah. field for me and in realizing we all kind of want the same things uh in life and i you know so, sorry that that's my most poignant uh you know moment but uh I, I, otherwise just the point uh getting back to my original point just how desolate the country was, how uneducated the people uh, were. Uh, we're not going to be able to make a lot out of this. I don't know what we, the United States, is trying to do here, but I just don't think we can do much with it. And I think that was my major takeaway. That's, a, that's what I was going to ask you. When you left in 2003, you know, it sounds like you're saying your sense was whatever we're trying to do here isn't is i mean beyond killing terrorists you know but uh, apart from that in terms of nation building or something whatever we're trying to do it sounds like you you already thought by 2003 it's not going to work yeah and i think most people uh it, there you know would, would feel the same way i mean let's give them health care uh, let's inoculate them 
But when you try to go into nation building uh, with a, another geographic area where the people are all rivals with each other, they don't speak the same languages, they don't want what we want. I mean, it's just not gonna gonna work. So, mm. uh, boy, it was just a bad road to uh, go down. But you know, that's the one we that's the one we took. So yeah, I would think most of the people after a month in Afghanistan would have told you the same thing. Wow. And yet it goes on for what, 20 years? Yeah, unbelievable. I'm guessing uh, as you're in Afghanistan, you, you're, you must be you know, generally aware of the debate about Iraq and weapons of mass destruction and all of that. I'm guessing that you're probably too busy in Afghanistan to be, being, to, uh, be paying attention to that in detail, I don't know. But now as we transition to Iraq, and then you know, I'd like to maybe hear some comparisons, Iraq, Afghanistan. Um, where were you, especially I think in light of what you had just experienced in Afghanistan, where was your own thinking on this whole you know, fervent discussion about what we're going to do with Iraq? Of course, there is the invasion in Iraq. I think the invasion of Iraq takes place before you get home from Afghanistan, if I Actually, I, I actually, Preston was not there an entire year. Uh, in fact, one of the reasons I came back uh, a little bit early is because the rest of the division was preparing for Iraq. So we were trying to fill holes, you know, everywhere. We had people in, we had one brigade in Afghanistan. We had two brigades getting ready to, to go to Iraq. Wow. And so actually in Afghanistan, we were keeping up with what was going on because the division was going to, you know, we all kind of knew, I think, that we were going to go to war. And so we were mainly focused on, you know, how's, how's this going to affect, you know, the division? How is it going to affect their personnel here? Lots of moving parts. So actually we were uh, keeping up. With that. And a, yeah. And, and as I said, the, the, uh, because, you know, you could be in Afghanistan today and, they say, hey, we need a body. You know, the division needs a body. So you're going to go with brigade to Iraq. So and the, the atmosphere, as I mentioned, the threat level was, was not high in Afghanistan mm -hmm. at that time. So we did have time to uh, focus on it. Um, but I mean, I can just tell you personally that even at that time, I thought the Iraq war was was was, was bad, uh, you know, that we that we should not do it uh, because I don't think people Many people, I, I just can't believe how cavalierly our leaders went into it. I think so many people don't understand the uh, destructive power of war and just how terrible it is. And I, I kind of have a saying, and I think I came up with this when I said, I say, once you loose, loose the dogs of war, they never come home. Uh, so you look at Vietnam now, there's Americans and Vietnamese who are still experiencing the effects of that war. Uh, mentally and emotionally and physically. And so once those dogs of war go down range, man, uh, ev everything is, is different. So yeah, um, I, I just did not think this was a, a good thing to do, but you know, who am I? I'm a major in the US Army. So really, I guess, you know, my main focus is how is this gonna affect the unit? How is it gonna affect me? And you just kind of, you know, do what you need to do to, um, Whatever you're going to have to do, you're going to, you're going to do it. Wow. Was that sense you had that, um, you know, this mission in Iraq, whatever, you know, of course, we don't know how it's going to unfold. Um, but your, your sense that it, whatever happens, it's not going to be good. Was that partly shaped by what you had seen and experienced in Afghanistan? Or do you think you would have come to that conclusion even without the experience in Afghanistan? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a that's a good question. I think it was just the fact, Preston, of just going to war, the commitment that it was going to take. I've got you know two wars going on at the same time, so I think it was just the enormity of the task uh, at hand of going to war. You know, again. Yeah, frankly. yeah. Now you actually your uh, service with the military ends is it two thousand. Four? 2004 uh, is when I retired. I, uh, 
quick funny story. I don't know if this is, a, you know, if, if you're into funny stories, but I just real, real quick. Yeah. Um, I, I was selected when I come back from Afghanistan, I was selected for command and general staff college, which only about 50% of the army majors uh, were selected for. So the summer of uh, 2003, um, I could have gone to CGSC. If I go to that, because I had orders, I was selected. If I go to CGSC, that means now uh, that I probably need to do about another seven years in the Army to make it worthwhile. And I'm like 42 because I had been enlisted. Mm -hmm. And I was really in this decision cycle. Do I go to CGSC and stay in the military? Or you know, do, I, do I retire? And so, interestingly, you know, I'd been, I'd been on jump status now, I guess, you know, that, that was about the ninth year or whatever, um, jumping out of airplanes in the 82nd. It just so happened that we had a zero two in the morning jump. And I come out of the plane and for the first time ever, I was over trees. And I said, I'm going to have a tree landing. And I never had it, had that happen in my life. And so I'm prepared for it. Do not lower my equipment. I go through the trees, mm -hmm. land in, a, in this little swamp, about six inches of water. I'm soaking wet. My chute's caught up and uh, I'm cutting myself, uh, trying to get it. I look over here and there is like a straight pine tree uh, without any limbs. And I'm like, I could have been impaled on that thing. It was really kind of shook me. So they dropped me on the opposite end of the drop zone. And so I get all my stuff and I'm running and I'm in great shape at this time. I was doing half marathons and I run so hard back down the other end of the drop zone that, that I puke. And so I get into, you know, our little assembly area and it's kind of, uh, it's, it's kind of a cool time of the day. And so I'm full of sweat, I'm full of swamp water and I'm shivering. And then the sun starts coming up and that little exercise ends. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm going to retire. I said, I was doing this 10 years ago, jumping out of planes uh, and rolling around in the dirt. And I said, and, and that's literally when I decided. And so I put was, my retirement tough. paperwork in and but I couldn't get out for another year. Uh, because yeah. they had a stop loss kind of thing. Right. So, so yes, so I got out of the Army in 2004 and immediately went up to the Beltway, uh, Washington, D.C. area because, you know, jobs were a plenty for uh, people with top secret clearances. Right, with intelligence background. And so you, you, yeah. do, you do go to Iraq four times as a civilian with the um, a Defense Intelligence Agency. And here, here I know that uh, there's a lot that you are you can't talk about right. um, things that, that you did in Iraq. But I'm interested in um, in hearing in hearing your thoughts about Iraq. And you go in first in 2007. You uh, go, your last trip is 2011. Um, I guess the first thing I'm interested in hearing is your thoughts about the evolution of things in Iraq. My memory of what's going on in the 2011 era, um, that's a little hazy. I think 2007, things are pretty pretty rough in 2007. That's a pretty tough time. So I'm interested in just when you, when you put these four tours of duty together, did you, you know, how would you describe the development of things in Iraq from 2007 to 2011, just based on your own experience? Well, I can tell you, and there's a little bit I can I, I can tell you. So I, I'm in this um, Iran Iraq cell in the Defense Intelligence Agency, and we are rotating people in and out of Iraq. And where most of the people are going is um, United States Forces Iraq headquarters. You know, the intelligence cell there in that Perfume Palace, and so in that in that palace. Uh, United States Forces Iraq headquarters element. Uh, you, had, you had the G2, uh, and we had different teams. We had the, um, uh, so intelligence analysts were working different things. We had the uh, Al Qaeda team. Uh, we had uh, Iraqi police team only focused on Iraqi police. Uh, we had the Sunni team. I actually was a Shia uh, team leader. So I, I focused on the Shia exclusively. 
And so for my, so, so for one tour, I did that. I had two tours where I went to JSOC up in Balad, Iraq, which is uh, Joint Special Operations Command, was just purely targeting. So I lended my intelligence analysts to the targeting cycle. And that, that's all you we mean did. Identifying and targeting the bad guys? The militants, yeah. yeah that's okay. right. The, the bad guys. And so it was just a human, uh, you know, going after humans, you know, going at the operators would go after bad guys. I was not an operator. I was an intel guy, but I helped develop the targets uh, sure. for that. So because I was a Shia militant guy, here's, here's what I saw. You know, we installed, we helped Maliki, who was a Shia, come to power. And that really fused the Iran uh, and the, the Shia uh, in Iraq. Uh, that, that fused that alliance. And so there was a problem in that the Iraq government was sympathetic to Iran and to the Shia militias, but Iran and the Shia militias uh, were our enemies and they were killing Americans. And so that was always the tension. When it came to the Sunnis and Sunni militants, that was I don't want to say easy, but you know the Iraq government was happy with us targeting AQ, uh, ISIS, and all these Sunni militants. They were fine with that. You know they don't like Sunnis anyway. But when we targeted the Shia militants, uh, it was more of a, uh, a a sensitive, politically sensitive issue. So, for example, if you were going to target to capture or kill a Sunni militant. You didn't even have to identify him uh, uh, only as a militant. That's all you needed to know. So, you know, uh, if, you, if you've, uh, you've got a cell phone or you see some act or whatever and he's going down the road, you know, you can, you can kill the guy. He's a Sunni militant. But with the Shia, uh, we, we had to identify who the person was. All right. Uh, because they wanted a, a, the Iraqi government wanted a better level of fidelity uh, on who we were targeting. Uh, because they didn't really like that we were uh, targeting Shia militants because of that alliance, of that alliance, but we did. And so that was one major source of tension. And then the other major source of tension was around this time, 2007, uh, some of the Shia militias said they wanted to reconcile with the U.S. Um, and we took part in that. And there were some of us who were vociferously arguing against reconciliation I'm just saying that it was a political ploy mm -hmm. uh, on, on the Shia militant side, but the leaders, the United States Forces Iraq uh, and the State Department uh, higher ups uh, felt like there was some promise in it. So we went down that road for a long time and then it blew up in our face and uh, it, it, it didn't work. So I think those were the two major tensions. And so that was my takeaway, Preston, in that, wow, you've got this friendly government we're having to deal with, but yet they are sympathetic to Shia militants and, and to Iran. So it sounds, to, it sounds to me like, although in Iraq, there, there's, there might be more of a conception of a nation than there is in Afghanistan, it sounds like still, though, there's, there's a commitment that, among many at least, <clears throat> that's deeper than the idea of the nation of Iraq. It's a commitment first to my group. Is, is that right? Is this another? Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah. that's absolutely uh, the way it is. And, you know, if you look at these hard, I'll say hardcore, I'll use that term. If you look at the, the Sunnis and the, the Shias, the ones who are really, you know, religious, I mean, they feel that the other is apostates more so than they feel the Jews are apostates. I mean, because they feel that the other group abandoned the true religion. And so they hate them more than they hate, you know, it, it's hard to get your head around wow. that, but you know, Shia militants hate Sunni militants more than they hate Jews or Americans because, you know, the Sunnis abandoned, you know, the, the true faith. Maybe we're just ignorant, you know, we've not come around. And so absolutely, it was all about ethnic cleansing and they were continually fighting. And, and you've got the Kurds up in the north uh, that were probably our true ally. And of course, they, all the groups just, they, they did not get along.
Sectarianism um, was probably worse in Iraq than it was Afghanistan because they had more toys, more resources, more money, and so they could kill each other um, in a more violent way. Wow. Um, now you said that in Afghanistan you went and went into Kabul and uh, you know you're taking photos of locals and uh, you know interacting. I imagine you're going to the market and things like that, or at least seeing it. Yeah. Um, I am guessing you're not having these kinds of casual tours uh, in the city in, in Iraq. I am not because you know, I now, I mean, before I was a, a soldier, you know, I had a clearance, a top secret clearance and all that, but now I'm in a very sensitive position and always thinking about kidnapping or, or whatever. So, I mean, I, there were times I could have gone out uh, in, into Baghdad or Balad, uh, but no, uh, absolutely not just because of my position and, you know, to capture an Intel guy, you know, that would you know, be a pretty, it, so yeah, it, it's dangerous. Right. So I never did. So was your, was your service in Iraq then, um, was it really flying, basically flying from the U.S. in an American bubble in the sky, that is a plane, into an American bubble in Iraq? And in, in a sense, you're not really in Iraq, you're just flying from one American bubble to the next. Is that, yeah. is that kind of how it is? Yeah, uh, that is how it is. Yeah. Uh, and you fly, fly from the U.S. straight into, uh, you know, one of the army camps uh, that we have there. I mean, we control the big area, the uh, Bayap, uh, Baghdad International Airport. You know, there, there are Iraqi forces there, but we control that area. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. And so as an intel guy, I, we would make our reads based on national intelligence, the, you know, the signals intelligence, the geographic um, intelligence uh, from human, we would have human collectors, you know, Americans who were out human there, intelligence, you yeah. know, collecting, yeah, yeah, human. And so we would take all of these sources and fuse them together and uh, a, a attempt to um, uh, do, you know, future, future and predictive analysis. But also, I got I got caught up in another role uh, while I while I was there in my, my first uh, my first tour in Iraq, uh, and that was and I don't exactly know how I got roped into this, but the leadership of U.S. forces uh, Iraq the, the intel guys they would have the you know the senior the, the colonels and and uh, generals would have these engagements with Iraqi leaders. And they would want me to bring me alone, uh, along with them. I think part of that was just so I could kind of gauge, is it BS, you know, what these guys are, are telling us. Mm -hmm. But I got caught up one time, they wanted me to do a, you know, bad cop, good cop kind of thing, where um, I was with this uh, engagement officer and he kind of confronted these Iraqi generals that, you know, it's the, you know, Paul here says it's the Shia militants that are attacking us, you know, and these are Shia, you know, military officers. And so he turns to me and, uh, you know, and so I go down that road and of course they're kind of kindly, you know, pushing back. Um, and uh, finally I asked the guys, okay, well, who is it in the South then that was Shia land? Who is it in the South that are attacking U.S. forces? Um, and, uh, the answer was, well, you know, AQ in the north is just much more of a problem. Is that Al Qaeda? But, yeah, Al Qaeda. Al -Qaeda. So I, I got caught up in. Uh, I would go downtown sometimes with with a few senior military leaders and do engagements with the you know, Iraq National Security Advisor, uh, some of their leading generals, and that kind of thing. And that's really where you could definitely see the duplicitousness mm -hmm. of uh, of the leaders and. Um, that it was all kind of a, a game to them. And, uh, you know, it's real quick, because uh, this will fit in somewhere. My, my last tour in 2011, I was a, a, what they call a by name request. There was a major Shia attack in January of 2011, unexpected attack. And the command element of US forces in Iraq actually sent a request to DIA to, to have me sent out as a special advisor to the J2, a, a two-star general. And so I went out there 
Um, and I did that and I advised him. But I'll never forget one time that our senior generals had come back from a conference from the Iraqis and they were upset because the Iraqis had said, you know, you Americans have been here uh, for, you know, how many years and you've never really given us anything and done anything for us. Well, of course, you know, we'd spent a ton of money on hospitals and all this kinds of stuff. But Preston, one thing that we, we don't do that I think we should do is that when we went into Iraq, we, we gave all this aid, building roads, building hospitals and all this. And we would say, this is the Iraq government doing it for you because we want to build up the Iraq government in the eyes of the people. And I get that. But then when you leave, nobody knows really what, what you've done. Yeah. And I remember Iran, when they would come into Iraq and they would build a hospital, uh, they would have an Iranian flag and we would say, we built this for you. So, you know, I, I really think in the future, that's what we need to do. You know, we need to have the U.S. flag. If we're for doing things for whatever country, we need to say we're doing it, not just say, oh, your government is doing it. Yeah. Were you there by chance when the incident happened, when the journalists threw the shoes at President Bush? Did you happen to be in country at that time? No, I, I was not. Um, that was under Bush. Yeah. Uh, so no, I, 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 I Probably 2008, I'm guessing. Um, do you have any recollection of your response to that event? Uh, yeah, it didn't surprise me. I mean, you, you, you know, these, most of these groups and leaders are, there's no loyalty, you know, as you know, the old saying countries don't have friends, they only have interests. And that was the same thing with the Iraq government. They were just, I mean, they don't really care for us. They don't like us. We're, yeah. we're not Muslim. I mean, it didn't surprise me whatsoever. I mean, just, that's the way things are, and they just want to try to get out of us what they can, and that's, I, that's what any nation would do around the world, I, I guess. Sure. You said that after about a month in Afghanistan, you had concluded that, you know, any thought of nation building in this place just isn't going to work. Um, how How was your thinking about Iraq? Did you at any point along this um, journey from 2007 to 2011, did, did at any point, did you think, well, maybe this can work? Maybe Iraq can be a, a secure, functional society. As, as President Bush spoke of it, you know, sort of a democratic light in the Middle East sort of thing, did you at any point think that that was plausible? No, because I saw the sectarian fissures. I saw the ethnic cleansing of neighborhoods yeah. in Baghdad. Never once. I, I thought if this does become a, a functional <laughs> government and society will just be, you know, by accident because they just bled each other to death and they just finally figure out it's best to, to get along. The, the, the traditional mindset of people is that a, a, a nation like the U.S. goes into a country and we start pulling the strings and we start manipulating. What we don't realize is those people are manipulating us uh, as it's natural to get what they can get. You know, they give us, oh, these guys are criminals over here, you know, so that we will target them. Or they do, oh, I can get you this, Americans. Yeah, I can help you with this, you know, and they start a business or whatever. My point is, is I think we're, we're ignorant as Americans that we think that we're the ones pulling the strings but these people down below are trying to use us, the, Ameri the largest of the American government, just as much as we're, we're trying to use them. And there's all kinds of outputs and outcomes that occur because of our reaction to their manipulations. You know, you've given us a general sense that here's a country where sectarianism is very strong. I think, again, we're looking at Nobody's asking the question, what's what's best for the country as a whole, or not very many people are asking that question anyway, um, that is people from that country. Um, did you have a sense that, that you know, that um, there were elements of, our, of the Iraqi system that were trustworthy, that could be counted on? Or was there always a sense that, you know, if something comes up, these folks that are with us now, they could 
they could be against us next week? No, I think in every country there are honest brokers. Uh, the problem becomes, just like in the States, is that the players on the margins always try to, they, they're, they're able to pull those moderates you know, to the left or to the right or, or whatever. So mm -hmm. there are those people uh, like that, but I think there's not enough of them. And these institutional forces of sectarianism is just probably too much for them to navigate. Yeah. Here's a question that, you know, we, we don't know what would have happened had the U.S. not invaded Iraq in 2003. So you know we're we're in the we're in the realm of fiction, but um, I've heard myself say, and it's kind of ref, a reflection on the you know the hardness of the world, the hardness of reality, that as bad as Saddam Hussein was in retrospect, um, removing him from power and removing his government from power may have actually made things even worse. Now that's 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 just the perspective of you know some guy in Arkansas who scans the newspaper. I'm interested in given your experience, you know, and it's a bleak thing. You you know, President Bush's pitch was this guy is so horrible, the world's going to be uh, so much better off if he's not in power. And that remains the argument even after the whole weapons of mass destruction thing falls apart. Well, at least we got rid of this truly truly awful guy. Um, but my conclusion is well. Yeah, he was truly awful, but what, what followed taking him out um, was maybe even worse. I, what's, do you have a, have a feeling about that? Yeah, I think unquestionably we, we can say that's the case um, on two levels. One, it empowered Iran. Yeah. I mean, just they, they have he a was major... a bulwark against Iran, wasn't he? He was. He was a bulwark yeah. uh, against Iran. Uh, but secondly, and here's the ultimate irony. The Christian community, I'm going to use the word destroyed, was essentially destroyed uh, during the Iraq war because of sectarianism. And so under, you know, Christians were free to worship uh, under Saddam Hussein. Uh, and they did worship and they were thriving. America comes in and disrupts everything. And now uh, the Sunnis and Shia are killing them, destroyed it. So uh, it's, a, it's interesting that we, as a you know, Christian country and a democracy, take an action that ends up with uh, essentially, uh, the, I mean, there's a lot of articles on this, and you may have read them, Preston, that you know, the, the, the Christian institution in Iraq was basically destroyed. Now talk about a bad outcome. The dangers of idealism when it gets detached from reality, right? I, I think that my perception is that President Bush early was very intoxicated by this idea of making a democracy in the Middle East. But that whole idealistic thing was just rooted in, a, a, as you use the word ignorance, just a, a complete lack of understanding of, of what of, I think of human nature, of, of the history of that region, of that culture. When you step okay. back, I mean, when you step back and, and look at this whole thing, um, you're in Afghanistan 2003, 2004, uh, Iraq, four different, four different missions there as a civilian with the uh, Defense Intelligence Agency 2007 to 2011. You look back and you sort of, you're, you're involved in these, or you participate in these two conflicts in different ways. Um, what is your perception? What's your thought? Your sort of your general thought as you, as you look at both of these things um, in retrospect. How the U.S. has no institutional memory, and we continue to repeat the same mistakes over and and over. It is mind-boggling. I can remember Preston. You know, the word uh, Hezbollah means party of God in, in Arabic. And of course, in Lebanon, you have um, Lebanese Hezbollah, right? So I remember I was in Iraq every year, and I remember every time a new uh, brigade or division would come into Baghdad, you know, they'd rotate every 12 months or whatever. I mean, I could set my clock, you could set a clock to this. 
the intelligence officer would say, oh my God, we have, we have Hezbollah operating in our sector. And I had a little handmade, ready to make sheet of like the six Hezbollahs in Iraq. You know, uh, they were all political parties. You know, and I'd send it to them and say, "No, these are political parties in their in their so 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 just things of that nature." Um, you know, I read, and this is this is going to seem like a silly uh, example, uh, but you know, the small things reflect the big things. You know, I read uh, an account of the Vietnam War uh, where the you know the North Vietnamese were using dogs to to sniff us out, and so uh, some of our special forces guy. I uh, got some tiger pee, uh, tiger urine to spray around their areas. Well, it didn't work. So I am in Afghanistan and I'm with the Australians and they have this compound and they'd balked early in the war. Some of these lazy Afghan goats, they were just sorry. I wouldn't, wouldn't do what they were supposed to do. So they had them in their compound and they also had these goats in their compound. And the problem the Australians were having was that out on the vast expanse, their operators were getting uncovered by these goats being able to smell them and they would just all go up and congregate around their hide, hide, hide site. And so the Australians had this medical doctor, vet, scientist or whatever, who said, hey, let's try some Siberian tiger urine. Well, I'll send it to you. And I was there when the Australians got the cyber, Siberian tiger urine, just like our special forces had the, the tiger urine, right? And I'll never forget, they took the tiger urine and there's goats around and they spray it on the ground. These goats start humping each other and rolling around in it, you know? And it's like, yeah, and probably in 20 years from now, you know, we'll have someone say, hey, what about Siberian tiger urine? But we just don't have a very good institutional memory. You know, when I when I started this working Shia militants, the same Iranian Quds Force officers were in Iraq at the start as, as they were at the end. Um, uh, Qasem Soleimani was a Quds Force officer in charge until he got killed. Okay, they they have this institutional memory. But in the U.S., we always want to rotate the people through these assignments, so these positions make them well-rounded. I don't think it does service. It does a disservice uh, to us. That's at the organizational level, but just at the macro level, I'm just really dismayed then that how we just don't learn lessons, and I just don't know if it's a mankind problem or it's a, an American problem. So what was happening was that. That was a special forces base right on the Pakistan border. And so these SF guys were continually getting rocketed and they asked the 82nd for help. So the commanding general sent me down there. Said, hey, Paul, go down there and help them see, you know, see, see what you can do. So I went down there. I, I surveyed the area. Um, I told them, I said, you know, I, I, I want to go, I, I need to know the terrain. And that's on the four wheel. We, we went into Pakistan. I was going around Pakistan looking at the terrain. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I developed with them essentially a, uh, a, a base defense plan, uh, uh, if you will, uh, because these guys were just like cowboys. I mean, they were just modern day cowboys on their own, just kind of doing what, what, what they wanted to do. These and, special oh, forces guys? Yeah, the Special Forces guys. Oh, I'm sorry. We gave them a platoon of uh, LURS, Long Range Security Detachment guys. And so, yeah, that was the concern is that we were giving them a platoon. So the commanding general, the 82nd, says, Paul, you know, we're going to give these guys up for a while. So I want to make sure, you know, they're taken care of and these guys aren't using them uh, just for however. So I went down there to Lawara to help set up the base defense plan. Make sure our guys aren't going to be, you know, cannon fodder or, or, or whatever. But, you know, the, the, at the end of the day, it was on the Pakistan border. Not much we could do. And it eventually was shut down. Then I guess it was opened back up called Firebase Tillman. Um, and then uh, I'm just down there, me holding the 107 millimeter. They had captured that uh, down there. But, you know, when you're on the Pakistan border, 
I mean, what are you going to do? They're shooting at you from Pakistan. You just, you know, you just can't really do much about it. I can't, right. Which, of course, as you're speaking, I'm thinking Cambodia, Laos, right? Yeah. Here in Vietnam. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. yeah same I mean, thing. You, you, you can, I guess. The Russians probably would, but we don't. So, <laughs> well, there is that an example of the rules of engagement? You know, because yeah, I'm, yeah. you hear Absolutely. the exact same thing from Vietnam vets. We're taking artillery from across the border, yeah. but we can't shoot back. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's right. Yeah, and just an example of the similar, yeah. the many, many similarities, you know, for all the differences, I think, especially between Afghanistan and Vietnam, there's so many similarities, including this one, that the enemy had, um, what's the right word, um, had um, sanctuary, sanctuary in across yeah. the border in Pakistan. Yeah, quite, quite frankly, I, I think we actually, um, I, I, th there are certain circumstances I think we, we would fire across the Pakistani border if there was a, a defined threat that we saw at the moment. Okay. Uh, but, but generally speaking, yeah, you know, these latent fire missions or whatever, you, you can't do them. But yeah, that is a function of the rules of engagement. Yeah, wow. and sanctuary, you know, and North Vietnamese had sanctuary in Laos uh, and, um, and the, the, uh, Militants, uh, Muslim extremists have sanctuary in uh, in Pakistan, and so yeah, mm, that's something. Now you are speaking from Chiang Mai, Thailand, and how so? How long have you been living in Thailand? Been in Thailand eight years. I've been in Chiang Mai one year, and I came here. I had my GI Bill, and so I used my GI Bill to get a master's and a PhD from Chulalongkorn University in Bangkok. And how I got interested uh, in the story of the, the Thai forward air guides is that, of course, about all I know, Preston, uh, is military subjects. And so I have to have a master's thesis. I have to have a doctoral dissertation. Uh, but uh, an American expat who became my mentor over here, I told him I was looking for a master's thesis. And he says, well, I have a subject uh, for you, and that is the Thai forward air guides. And their story had never been told in English. And what the Thai forward air guides, guides were, were about over a hundred guys that were recruited off the street uh, in, in Thailand. Their only qualification was that they could speak English. Uh, they were CIA contract employees. The CIA sent them up to Udon Thani, Royal Thai Air Force Base, uh, for a two week course in forward air control procedures, which our Air Force Special Ops taught them. Uh, and then they were sent to Laos to coordinate our aircraft uh, operations. Um, uh, they didn't control them, they, they coordinated them. A little bit of a difference, but it's probably the only time, and it, it is the only time in US history in the past and probably the future, where we will recruit foreign civilians to coordinate our aircraft operations in, a, in another country. So these are, these are Thai civilians who can speak English and they're in, um, what, they're, they're looking for, are they across the border in, in Laos? They are. And so, what, and so what are they, what sorts of things are they looking for? And we're talking about the Vietnam era, right? So yeah, yeah, it's the Vietnam into the early 70s, yeah. That's right. So what they would do in coordinating, so here's what happened, Preston. Um, in 1970, the U.S. and Thailand came to an agreement uh, because we had no ground forces in Laos, right? And so the Thai said, if you will fund this effort, we will send... Uh, volunteer troops to Lao to fight the Patet Lao communists and the North Vietnamese. And they did. And, but they said, uh, and the CIA ran the operation. But what happened, there were so many guys on the battlefield and so much US air coming through that there were some fratricide incidents. And so the CIA came up with this idea let's recruit Thai, we'll put them on the battlefield, they can interact with the Thai battalions. We'll teach them forward air control procedures. They're talking to air aircraft uh, and they can guide, um, do forward air control procedures to guide um, airplanes to, to hit the target. 
conduct um, you know aerial or, or resupply operations, medical evacuations, that kind of thing. Because these guys can speak English, they um, they understand aircraft procedures now, so they can really help us out a lot uh, to present the practice side. So if I have it right, then these guys are on the ground communicating with American pilots and giving and and Lao pilots and Hmong pilots and Thai pilots because. All of them had air forces. There. Fighting against the, the communist forces that are coming into Laos. And my understanding is have the ambition to come into Thailand as well. Well, they did. Um, yeah. it, it was, there, there's some factors that, that, that caused that not to happen, but yes. Uh, and in fact, when uh, and, you know, the war ending was part of that. But uh, in 1978, when in December of that year, when the Vietnamese invaded Cambodia, they pushed all the way up. They had, um, I think, eight or 11 Vietnamese divisions on the Thai border. There was actually fighting. You can go back in the Bangkok Post and find, you know, the artillery duels and uh, infantry, some small scale infantry skirmishes between the Vietnamese and, and the Thai. So, yeah, if you look historically, the Vietnamese and Thai have always been, been, been big enemies. And so the PRC and the North Vietnamese made very clear uh, that Thailand uh, was on their list for conquest and they supported the insurgency here. Uh, it was a very nasty insurgency, but fortunately Thailand had the help of the United States and they were uh, on the other side of the Mekong River. So geography helped them a little bit. And now, do you think it's fair um, when we speak of the Vietnam War as this big thing, you know, we talk about South Vietnam, of course, but then also Laos and Cambodia come into it. Um, you include these, the work of these guides as part of the Vietnam struggle writ large, sort of the, you know, the thousand page book about, you know, the comprehensive history of the Vietnam War, these guys come into that story? Yeah, I do. And I think that's why foreigners refer to it as the Second Indochina War. So in the Second Indochina War, you had the Lao theater, the Vietnamese theater, the Cambodian theater. Absolutely. It's part of the war. Yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of times the domino theory is just casually dismissed. I mean, I'm just interested in your response to this. Um, the domino theory is casually dismissed. But then I think, well, but, you know, Laos and Cambodia did become communist, and it looks like they had designs on Thailand, um, and those designs were thwarted. You know, the Australians are there, the Thai forces are there, American forces are there, these guides that you've studied are playing an important role. It looks like had that effort not been made in Thailand, Thailand at least would have been significantly threatened. And so, you know, Certainly in terms of, you know, there goes Thailand, there goes Burma, there goes, you know, all the way out to the Middle East or something, Dom, that domino theory didn't work out. But I'm not so sure about casually dismissing it. Um, what, what's your own thought about that? Well, yeah, I agree. And Thailand definitely was threatened. Uh, I mean, they, I think they lost something like, um, I've got the number 21,000 civilians were assassinated or, and were murdered during the insurgency. Wow. So I guess the domino theory is, is true to that degree. But I, I think, Preston, kind of what you said, if you go back and, and look at what some of our politicians were saying, I mean, they were extending that domino theory uh, and they were saying it so casually. Oh, if one country goes, you're going to have Indonesia, you're going to have Australia. Burma, you know, all of Australia. Yeah, they mentioned Australia. So yeah. they kind of mentioned it a little bit too casually. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, certainly aggression is aggression. And when you have, I mean, um, uh, I mean, I think actually the, the North Vietnamese, so, and, and I don't want to get off track here, but, and this is where, our, you know, we, we should know our history, but the Thai and the Vietnamese were fighting over Laos going back to the uh, early 1800s. And so they were actually uh, going into the middle of Laos and fought the Vietnamese and the, the, the Thai and fighting each other. And the Vietnamese were pushing up to the Mekong River. Thailand in the, from 1820 to about 1855 
had a major depopulation campaign uh, in Laos, uh, and they went over there to the other side of the Mekong and um, took all the Lao, uh, literally all the Lao, brought them into Thailand. That's why you have such a large Lao population. Thailand burnt that whole area, and so, <clears throat> uh, and so they were fighting over this. So that history of aggression. Uh, was always there. And so fighting over Lao for the Thai and the Vietnamese was, was nothing new. Uh, and, you know, for us, it was. So when the PRC and the uh, North Vietnamese say, uh, you know, they want to conquer South Vietnam and uh, they, they think that the entire Southeast Asia should uh, be communist because they supported those insurgencies, then, yeah, I mean, you can call it domino, you can call it just communist aggression or expansion. I don't know what term you label it, but uh, certainly that is true. If one country falls, now you've got an enemy on your border, right? I mean, now Thailand, you know, when Laos fell, fell, now Thailand has a communist enemy on its border. So there's, yeah, there's some justification for that.